Some have seen ghosts disappear like smoke. But what about humans who burst into flame? If I were not there to see it, I wouldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. There was uh, a little bit of a leg and a little bit of a skull left. The rest was ash. Number five on our list may well be the most gruesome of human mysteries. SHC, spontaneous human combustion. Spontaneous human combustion is the ability of the body to smoke, blister, or otherwise burn without contacting a source of ignition. Spontaneous human combustion is horrific, macabre, and according to mainstream science, impossible. Since the earliest cases of SHC in the 15th century, spontaneous human combustion has sometimes been explained as punishment from God. A hundred years ago, it was claimed that all victims of spontaneous human combustion were alcoholics and drunkards. This was the vengeful wrath of God for living an immoral and temperate life. In the 20th century, there were over 300 reported incidents of spontaneous combustion. And by all reports, this phenomenon is on the rise. In 1974, the late Jack Angel survived a fire that doctors said came from the inside out. When Mr. Angel awoke from a prolonged sleep, he noticed that his right forearm and hand had been charred black, burned to the bone, he told us. We have Mr. Angel's medical records based on that treatment. The medical reports diagnose the injuries as, quote, internal in origin. Peter Jones claims to be a victim of SHC. His wife was a witness. All of a sudden, he appeared to erupt in a cloud of smoke, and it appeared to be coming from his legs. And I jumped up and looked under the bed and the covers and everything and couldn't find anything burning. When it was over, I said, what was that, Peter? And he said, beats the hell out of me. Could it have been spontaneous human combustion? People that don't think it exists, that's, that's great. I mean, I really don't care whether they think it exists or not. It happened to me. One of the strangest and most investigated SHC cases of the 20th century is the fiery fate of fireman George Mott. On the mattress in which Mr. Mott burned through lay one lower right leg, severed cleanly just below the knee joint. The rest of Mr. Mott's 180-pound body had burned basically to powder. The individual himself burnt through the floor and the damn house didn't burn down. So how do you do that? What could have caused this blaze? And how can a fire burn so hot that it consumes a man, yet leaves the room standing? Our people went through the electrical, went through the gas stove, went through the heater. We determined that it was not suicide. We determined it was not a homicide. The only thing possible would be spontaneous human combustion. But not everyone agrees. Scientists claim that spontaneous human combustion is not paranormal, but the product of the wick effect, in which the body catches fire and burns in its own fuel. In some cases, accidental fire deaths look just like SHC. In 1997, John DeHaan tested this theory by setting fire to a 120-pound pig carcass wrapped in a cotton blanket. One of the most startling effects of these kinds of scenes is the destruction of the bones. They actually still looked like they were intact, but if you attempted to touch them, they were like picking up a cigarette ash. They would just crumble. The experiment proved to scientists that a fire can reduce a body to ash without spreading. But for believers, there were two problems. 
That's not really a fair experiment because in many cases that history is called SHC, there is no external ignition. Mm -hmm. If you don't have an external ignition source, if you don't have an accelerant dousing the body to make it more flammable, then you apparently have a real dilemma, which brings us back to spontaneous human combustion. So what is behind these amazing blazes that seem to erupt from within the human body? In our 25 years of research into this phenomenon, we have yet to find someone who, having seen all the evidence, can tell us, oh yes, this is how this happened. Spontaneous human combustion is one of the great mysteries confronting medicine and mankind. If the body has the unexplained ability to burst into flame, what unexplained power accounts for mystery number four? Prediction is a billion dollar business. Two thirds of Americans believe in psychic phenomena and 60% believe that they have had psychic experiences. Is it possible to see across time and space? One of the common methods that psychics use to get people to believe in them is something called a multiple out. For example, let's assume I had a dream last night in which I was in a serious car accident. And sometime in the next day or week, I'm in a serious car accident. That can make the dream look prophetic. But what if my friend is in a serious car accident? My girlfriend is in one. That's a hit, too. There's a lot of shoe-fitting going on in regard to psychic experiences. But this is precisely why we bring ESP into the laboratory. One of the more successful experiments that we've been using and other labs have been using is called the Gansfeld experiment. In this experiment, a sender attempts to mentally communicate an image to a partner rooms away. The receiver then tries to pick the same image from a choice of four. Random chance allows that one in four guesses will be correct, a 25% hit rate. What we're finding is 34, 35, even higher percentages of hitting, which means that somehow these subjects are getting the information more than chance would allow. Because of the success of such experiments, when the U.S. received reports during the Cold War that the Russians were using psychic spies to gather intelligence and plan military tactics, they didn't laugh. They spent $20 million playing catch-up. The Stargate program was a federally funded uh, investigation of extrasensory perception to see whether, first, whether it was real, or secondly, if it were real, could we use it for matters of national interest, like for the military or to gather intelligence? We worked at empty desks with papers and pens. Normally, our tasking was usually given to us in a sealed envelope. What they would say to us is uh, something like, well, we've lost a uh, piece of equipment, and it can be anywhere in the northeastern continental United States you need to tell us where it's located. For over 17 years, Joe McMonagall was one of this country's top remote viewers, a military term for a clairvoyant. In 1981, Stargate used McMonagall in an effort to locate General James Dozier, kidnapped in Italy by the Red Brigades. McMonagall was able to provide a street name, building floor, and a description of the general's condition, all details that were confirmed as accurate during Dozier's retrieval. My accuracy in the Dozier case really surprised me. With remote viewing, it's one of the surprises you always get. Uh, see, one of the deficiencies with remote viewing is really knowing just how accurate the information is until it's used. Theories abound, but nobody knows for certain how this critical information is actually transmitted or received. Information goes from here to here in ways we don't understand. We name that anomaly extrasensory perception. Do I believe in it? No. But is the evidence for something interesting going in? Absolutely. From inexplicable human incineration to extrasensory perception, numbers five and four prove that some of the world's ultimate mysteries lie within the human body. Coming up, believers and skeptics argue, are we alone? In the living world, there are things beyond reason. It was a feeling more than anything for me. Strange energies sort of surrounding us. I felt someone tap me on my side. And I realized I was home alone. But how do you reason with things that aren't living? No, I've just seen a gentleman walk straight through. There was a cover-up, and it's perfect. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
She's panicking. Guiding spirits into the light. Rescue mediums. Saturdays and Sundays on Zone Reality. Once you step through these doors, it's serious. Some people have died, some people have lived. Working 24 hours straight can be a regular shift. We can go longer. And where your first thought might be their last rites. It's remarkable how the body can heal itself. In trauma, the theatre's a stage where every act could save someone's life. It's about as good as it gets. Discover the stories behind the statistics in trauma. Saturdays and Sundays on Zone Reality. Britain's obesity rates are enormous. I know that it's the wrong food for me, but I can't stop it. Every day's a struggle. Diets don't seem to be working. These are people who have tried everything. So the last resort is going under the knife. Meet the surgeon fighting to restore the nation's health. There is no margin for error. I've lost seven stone in seven months. People smile at me now. Fat Doctor, Mondays to Fridays on Zone Reality. Our Ultimate Ten Countdown of Unexplained Mysteries already includes ghosts and ESP. If spirits and thoughts may travel through the air, what about the number three mystery, unexplained flying objects? Hey, have you all had any uh, reports of unknown flying objects over there? No, we haven't. Oh, okay, I was wondering, we supposedly are having quite an invasion over here. <laughs> While conducting research at the National Archives, Sam Sherman discovered a declassified audio tape, rare government documentation of a UFO sighting. On October 7, 1965, at Edwards Air Force Base in California, the air traffic controller noticed odd luminous objects coming over the field. According to Sherman, these objects were picked up on radar at eight different defense locations across the western U.S. Fearing enemy craft, the Air Force launched their own planes to investigate. This thing just, bing, went up, evaded him, and that was it. Accounts of unidentified lights in the sky date back at least to the Middle Ages. They weren't called UFOs, they weren't called flying saucers, but certainly they would be the same type of phenomena. It's been there throughout history if you know how to look and where to look. Human interpretations of UFOs have changed with the times. Medieval sightings were interpreted as signs from God. 18th century naturalists called them gas and plasma. During the Industrial Revolution, these sightings became machines and aircraft. And with the Space Age came the era of the Flying Saucer. I am here to discuss the so-called Flying Saucers. By 1948, sightings of UFOs by credible witnesses were so numerous that the Air Force decided to investigate. For over two decades, Project Blue Book collected information on 12,600 reported cases of objects in the sky, from weather balloons to meteorological events. In 1969, the project was shut down with this statement. We have, as of date, come to only one firm conclusion, and that is that it does not contain any conceivable threat to the United States. It's important to make the distinction between the question, are there extraterrestrial intelligences somewhere in the universe, and have they actually come here? There are thousands, even tens of thousands of sightings around the world annually. But, but most of these, of course, everyone would admit, 90%, even high 90s percent, that these are natural phenomena. And many people don't even realize that the stars actually appear to move during the night. Misidentification is rampant, but ufologists insist that alien crafts bear uniform traits. They move in ways that airplanes just don't move in. We're talking right angle turns, stop on a dime, hover, go straight up in the air, uh, come down in, in weird floating patterns like a leaf. 
But we don't know what extraterrestrial or other intelligence type craft should look like. But we know what our own stuff looks like. If we find something up there which doesn't obey the laws of physics as we know it, we can say that they belong to somebody else. Somebody else knows something we don't. On September 19, 1961, Betty and Barney Hill were driving through New Hampshire around midnight when they claimed to have spotted a pancake-shaped light with two rows of windows that appeared to be following them. Two hours later, Barney and Betty woke up 35 miles south of where they had stopped. Under hypnosis, nightmare images of having hair, fingernail, and skin samples removed, and descriptions of small gray aliens came flooding back. The Hill story was the first the world heard of unexplained mystery number two. Since that night in 1961, thousands more have come forward with the claim that they too were the victims of alien abductions and experiments. An abduction experience is fast, efficient, very traumatic to the person, and very often the memory of it is partially wiped out. Debate in the field of hypnosis throws the accuracy of recalled abduction memories into question. This is a case of false memories planted by therapists through this guided imagery, this fantasy role playing, because that's what hypnosis is. It's fantasy role playing between the hypnotist and the subject. But hypnotherapists believe that they can prove that a hypnotized subject will not simply go along with a guided story. In a given hypnotic session, I can ask probably 10, 20 uh, leading questions, false leads, and uh, I've never had anybody slip up. Since most described abductions occur in bed at night, skeptics dismiss the phenomenon as sleep paralysis. This occurs when a person is in that funny in-between state between just falling asleep and just being awake. During that state, your body is usually paralyzed, but your mind is awake. Apparently the dream mechanism is kind of kicking on, so you're having these dreams, but you're awake but paralyzed. There's a lot of attendant other things which do not go along with sleep paralysis. For instance, if you have a group of people who have been taken from different places into the same craft, when they're dressed, sometimes they go back in somebody else's clothes. A woman who had a running suit on when she went to bed or doesn't own a nightgown, when they put her back in bed, she's wearing somebody's fancy nightgown that she was terrified to find. For Beth Collings and Anna Jamerson, the proof is in the memories. They say they have been abducted together, and more than once. Beth and I have many recollections of experiences where we have been abducted together. And one morning, we were both feeling pretty sick, and I said, something happened. And she says, well, last night, the aliens were there, and I saw them inject something in the back of your neck. Can I check the back of your neck underneath your hair? I said, sure, you won't find anything. But she did. There was a hole in the back of my neck exactly where she had seen them inject me with something into the back of my brain. I thought being crazy would be preferable to telling anyone, even Anna, that this is what I remembered. I couldn't pretend that it didn't happen and I couldn't forget what I remembered. When you have evidence like that, it's very hard not to believe that you are really being abducted. And I know I'm being abducted. After I had gone through so many cases and seen so much trauma and so much physical evidence, I, at some point, was asked, do you really believe all this? And I said, with sadness, I realize I no longer have the luxury of this belief. From strange ships in the sky to stranger trips on board, Unexplained Mysteries 3 and 2 prove our fascination with life beyond our world. From the inner mind to outer space, 
the debate between belief and skepticism brings us to the ultimate mystery. From the moment we are born, we inch toward our own demise. The concept of an afterlife is the founding principle behind all major religions. But the number one unexplained mystery remains. Is there any proof of life after death? I had lost my body and I'd become a little blue star. At the time, this seemed like a very normal thing for me to have happen. <laughs> I had an, an idea of myself going, wow, I don't have a body anymore. I'm free of my body. If you can imagine on Star Trek, when they go into warp speed, how you see all the lights kind of go, whew, well, that's how it felt. And now I'm going, at, at what felt like, I don't know, a zillion miles an hour. Every culture has its own idea of the afterworld. But where do we get our knowledge of worlds beyond the living? There's been an effort for at least a century to examine the afterlife and visitations with the dead and spiritual communication. People don't want to die. They're crushed when their loved ones die. What can they do? Can they transcend death? Oh, I think life after death, God, the spirit world, something that's beyond the physical here and now. That's the ultimate mystery that fascinates people and cannot be tested ultimately uh, by science and short of going there. <laughs> but you can't come back to report what happened. Or can we? Advanced medical technology can now bring people back 10, 20, even 30 minutes after the heart or lungs stop functioning. Those that come back from the brink share stunningly similar tales. Very commonly, people have what's called an out-of-body experience. In other words, they see their consciousness apart from their body. Very often following that, they'll have a tunnel experience. At the end of that tunnel, they'll generally encounter beings of light. These beings may be deceased relatives or friends or perhaps religious figures. Very often at this time, they'll have a life review. Some scientists contend that these experiences actually describe the physiological process of death. What happens in near-death experiences from a physiological point of view is that the brain loses its oxygen supply or its oxygen supply is reduced. That causes neurons in the visual part of the brain, the visual cortex, to start responding very rapidly for a period of time. And that results in the perception of these long tunnels, bright lights, that sort of thing. In laboratory tests, gravity-induced loss of consciousness has produced out-of-body experiences, tunnel vision and white lights, replicating some, but not all, of the near-death experience. About 15% of people have what we call frightening near-death experiences. There were people being tortured and volcanoes erupting and brown sludge and screaming and people you know, just their heads on, on pikes and everything you can imagine of in the, in the classic idea of a hell. If it was true that it was just the body's physiological response to death, I would think that everyone would have an identical experience, but I didn't. Experiencers have read tags off the top of ceiling fans, recounted conversations rooms away, and even brought tangible information back from beyond. Occasionally during near-death experience accounts, people encounter someone that identifies themselves as a relative that they had during their life. And they may say, I don't remember, I never had a brother, I never had a sister. And yet, they come to find out that this was a brother or a sister who died perhaps very, very early in their life. It's certainly evidential that something's going on up there. If people have returned from the brink and beyond, what messages are they bringing back? What I experienced was a huge downloading of information. Before I could ask, you know, well, what, what, you know, am I dying? I heard, we don't die. The body dies. The spirit, the soul never dies. Probably the greatest mystery that confronts humanity is what happens after we die. Millions of people have had experiences like this. This is very common. The message they bring back, very consistent. There is an afterlife, and it's wonderful. Is there life at the end of the tunnel? 
The Ultimate Question wraps up our countdown of the Ultimate Ten Unexplained Mysteries. The need to create an orderly world governed by dependable rules is central to the human mind, and yet the ultimate answers continue to elude us. Although we have learned more about the Earth and the cosmos in the last 25 years than in all recorded history, the more we probe, the more mysterious the world has become. In the expanding sphere of scientific knowledge, the more it grows, the greater its contact with the unknown. And so it will always encounter more and more unknown. We're never going to know everything.